by people and we always you know look at that and say man it's a lot of stuff there that people have done but what i want you to rather do is to read the next two um student presenter bios is to be more inspired by them and to understand that you can still become very involved in your communities even as a student um and i'm sure that you probably had the opportunity to connect with both of our student presenters over the weekend so you'll know that they're just like us. They're just people with the common mission to take care of our communities. Um, I've known Essence for a couple of years. She is definitely passionate about midwifery. Um, she volunteers a lot, um, but not just in her community on national levels and organizations. We heard her speak about you know, the development of a mentorship program, um, which I know that she'll be very good at. Um, but she also has a passion for international things um, and just kind of learning about how cultures and traditions um, that have been going on for a very long time affects the patients that we may actually take care of in our own communities, which is something that we always need to um, keep in the back of our minds. She participates in many national organizations, which is also very inspiring because again, you know, as students, we often say, I don't really have time for that. But I really encourage you to connect with her just to kind of say, hey, you know, I see that you're in a lot of these organizations. How do you fit it in? Um, and how do I continue to keep my hands in those organizations, those communities to make sure that I stay connected? So today, Essence is going to be talking to us about midwifery care in Guatemala. So please welcome her. Thank you, Ketrin. It's an honor to be up here today. I truly appreciate this opportunity. So thank you so much for being here for allowing me the, the chance to present again for my second year here at Diversity Impact. Um, I also wanted to just contribute to Dr. Stone and Dr. Malfo as, as well for allowing me to be here. And thanks, I see they're amazing. Without them, what would you do? I really appreciate that. So today we're going to be talking about the sacred calling of the home of Mona. A tribute to traditional Mayan birth and postpartum healing practices, rituals, and remedies. Um, I actually had a, the opportunity to do study abroad in Guatemala, but the reason how I had this opportunity is because I went to the American College of Mission Weekly Conference and I came across this midwife. Can anyone hear me for a while? Awesome, okay. Um, and I went to the and um, I met this midwife named Nicole May. And Nicole May is actually the, the, the director of Maya Midwifery International. And uh, she had the baby of um, yeah, um, the following pieces here. Can I ask you to mute, mute them? Perfect. Perfect. Um, and she had a beautiful display of, of, of Guatemalan pieces at her table. And I was so fascinated. I came up to her and I said, oh my goodness, uh, where did you get this beautiful stuff from? You know, she said she's in part of this Guatemalan program. And I had heard so much about Guatemala because many of my nursing colleagues um, who went to the University of Pennsylvania got a chance to do study abroad there. So, and I've always been fascinated by the birth rituals and things of that nature. So I connected with her. She gave me her card. I contacted another midwife who she knew who was actually staying in Guatemala and you know, working on her doctorate, uh, who was a CPM. Her name was Sarah Pichel from uh, actually from New York, um, where she practiced. And she allowed me to come out there with her to basically be her, you know, uh, her you know, mentee and train with her, which was a fascinating opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I encourage you all to, to get involved with ACNM um, if, if we can. Okay. So just to give you an overview of the presentation, this is going to focus on information gathered from specific interviews. I actually had the opportunity to interview maybe about three um, million uh, midwives. And then it comes from the Hmong community in Concepcion Chiquirichapa, which is about four hours outside of Antigua. And then I also focused on this ethnographic research on birth and postpartum rituals, because that is actually what I'm interested in doing my doctorate and nursing practice on, because I'm fascinated by cross-cultural um, birth rituals, and, and they, they have an interesting link, and we'll talk about that as we go along. And then traditional herbal healing remedies. How many of you guys love homeopathic medicine? Well, all right. I'm a huge advocate of myself, um, and so I love talking about holistic treatments. So we're also going to touch on that as well. Okay, so this is ACAM Birth Center. Can everyone see from this side here? Perfect. Um, this is the center where I actually worked with the midwives here, as you can see. Um, and ACAM stands for the Association de, uh, de Comodoros del Area Mom. And Mom is the indigenous uh, Mayan language. There's also another one called Cachiquel, which they speak outside of Tisunana, which is maybe about so, two minutes from Antigua. 
And so it's, it's, it's an interesting language, but it has a lot of X's and Q's at the ends of you know, various different words and things of that nature. So uh, forgive me if I'm pronouncing some of them wrong throughout the presentation, but I'll, I'll do my best to, to, to make it happen for you all here today. Um, so again, the Concepcion Chiquiri Chapa is located in the Western Highlands of Guatemala. So it's all these mountains, you think we had to go through a lot just to get to, to Highland? Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, I was like, uh, it was loops and, and valleys just to get to where this is located in a, a very indigenous rural area. Um, and it's owned and operated by these Mayan midwives. They actually started this program up with the help of Nicole May. Um, and so part of what they do here, they do prenatal care, birth, um, postpartum care, and they also do home visits. And as a public health nurse, I, I have a, a great deal of respect for midwives and nurses who do home visitation in the community because I do that too through my job. And you learn so much more about the, the client when you see where they live, right? Um, and then moving right along here, they also have a beautiful herbal garden in the back of this A. Canberra Center. And we'll talk about that as we move along. So who are the comadronas? So comadronas actually is the term for midwife in Latin America. They also use another term, particularly in Mexico, called patera. So how many people speak Spanish here? Well, all right, so you guys can help me with some of the pronunciation. Um, my boyfriend's Puerto Rican, so he's been trying to help me. I can't wait to I'm fluent because when you speak another language, you get so much more opportunities in the field, particularly in midwifery. So I encourage you all, definitely take up a second, third language if you can. Um, so moving right along here, as you can see, um, birth is very woman-centered. Take a look at this picture here. Do you see any men in this picture? No, all women, right? And they're all supporting and providing that holistic care for this woman here in the middle. And so that's pretty much what they focus on here in, in Guatemala. Um, now, I have to say that due to um, education, gender, and also ethnicity, these midwives are often devalued in the healthcare system. They're looked down upon by many of the Latinos in the urban community in Guatemala City, which is the, you know, the most popular city there in Guatemala. And so they, they're often scapegoated and blamed for the high maternal and infant mortality rate in Guatemala. <laughs> So let me just tell you, I did some work in um, Haiti, the Midwest the Haiti program, and Haiti has actually the highest infant mortality rate in the Western Hemisphere, but Latin America and Guatemala has the highest um, infant mortality rate within the Latin American region. So it's, it's, it's an extreme health disparity there, and we really need to do something about that um, globally. Okay, so moving right along, the sacred calling of the Comadronas. I really wanted to take a note on this because um, we always talk about how midwifery is this wonderful calling. Well, in Guatemala, uh, the midwives call the calling the dawn. And the dawn is like this sacred gift from God that almost was destined to happen, like this intuition that you get, essentially. And so as, when I was doing the interview with uh, one of the midwives, Christina, um, she was telling me, I said, well, you know, and again, my preceptor was fluent in Espanol, so she was translating all this information. I had recorded it all on my phone, and so it was a lot of work, a lot of notes that I took. But anyway... Um, as she's talking, she's telling me how she got the dome, this, this sacred calling. She said she was walking along the road, and, you know, they have cobblestone roads in our mouth, but there's a lot of, you know, stones and dirt. And she came across this really big stone, and the stone was in the shape of a baby's head. And she, she picked it up, and she looked at it, and she said, wow, there's like almost like a baby smiling at me. And she said, this is the dome, this is a sign. She said, and they, they're really big on visions and, and signs and things of that nature. And I am too, and my family, I mean, used to say that about my great-grandmother who was also a midwife from Nassau, Bahamas. Um, and she used to have visions. And they say she was born with a call. We'll talk about that later. That's a whole other topic. Um, but yes, so essentially these visions are, are real. They, they, they are true. And when the, the midwife in Guatemala does not um, go forth with that calling, illness or um, bad things are said to inflict upon her. So again, it's like it's destined to happen. So it's so important that we take note of that calling. Okay, so let me just highlight here, I wanted to just introduce you to some of the midwives who I had the opportunity and, and to work with. They're amazing. Um, the first young lady here is Maria Azucena Fuentes Diaz. She's like amazing. She's a powerhouse. Um, she's about four foot eleven, uh, of right here, but she's a she's powerful man, I'm telling you, and inspirational. She's also uh, one of the founders of the Kemper Center. She's a, the board of directors. She's also a firefighter. I mean, she's amazing. And she's the herbal specialist. And they gave her a lot of respect at the APM Center because Asusena was the only one who knew how to do IVs, which was interesting. You know, during that, that time, we had a woman who was dealing with, she was severely dehydrated. So um, it, it's the first thing they did was call Asusena because she wasn't going to call that day. And she came in in her slippers and was ready and, and got it all set up for everyone. And so she's really brilliant, very smart young, young woman, woman there. 
Um, and then she's also training her daughter to be a midwife as well. Now, Antonina, she is, is like the mecca of all midwives. She's the uh, the, uh, the first founder of the Aiken Birth Center. She also is fluent in English, so a lot of the uh, translations that we did were with, was with the help of Antonina. And she's been to the Americas, so she's, she's the only one out of all the midwives who's seen the United States. Um, and she's also highly respected in the community. I mean, they come to her for wisdom, advice, um, for you know, uh, all, all types of ailments and things of that nature. She's she's amazing. Um, and this is her daughter here, Melda. Um, and Melda is a fascinating young lady here. She she catches on really quickly. She's a secretary. She's a great great writer, very articulate. She also speaks English because Anthony trained her in that as well. Um, and it's interesting. Uh, one of the doctors from California who also came down during that time period when I was there um, to work with the midwives. Um, sent a ultrasound machine because they had never had one. Um, so, and they needed to be able to, to check the positions of the baby and things of that nature and look for abnormalities. And so they trained Melba and she learned it, I swear, like in two days and she was teaching other midwives. So she's, she's just really quick on her feet, wonderful um, young lady. And that's her son in the back. He's like, he's like what, eight now, but he's, he's so cute, adorable. Um, and then we move on to Christina. So Christina is actually um, the artist of all the midwives. She made a lot of these things here, for uh, many of them for me. But she's fascinating, including these earrings you see on my ears here. I actually was work walking to the marketplace one day, and I forgot to put the backs on the earrings. And I lost one of them, and I had to tell uh, Christina. She said, oh, well, what about making another one? I said, oh, she's so sweet. So she's awesome. And she also is known for making the Lestones. Now, this is actually a Lestone. And a Lestone is basically like the indigenous um, hair wraps that they wear. You know, in various different cultures, they have different, um, you know, dress codes and things of that nature that they wear. And, and, and she actually made this for me, believe it or not. And there's a bird in here. And she said the bird represents protection. Because when I was there, you know, I was by myself. I was the only black person there. If you can imagine, I, I stuck out like a sore thumb. Um, and I didn't speak the language. So it was very hard for me personally to try to, you know, blend in and things of that nature. But when I say these midwives took care of me, they took me in as one of their own. I had a tremendous amount of respect for them. And I will never forget this um, this experience that I had for the first one of them. So I just want to pass this little stone around for you to take a look at. Um, so who am I along here? Santos. Santos is actually right here. Santos Lopez Romero. She was like my grandmother when I was there. Um, I spent a majority of my time with her. And the reason why I say that is because at one point, Sarah Pichelle, the midwife, the CPM who I was working with at the time, she has a home there in um, Guatemala and in Antigua, in, in to see or not. Um, and so she left at a particular time period for about a week. Um, and so I was just there by myself with the midwife. She asked me if I wanted to go to San you want to go? I said, no, I'm staying here with the midwife. Just because they have births, I'm good. Bye. <laughs> you know, so she left. And because her son, her son also has Asperger's, so she, you know, she wanted to spend time with family. Um, but essentially, I was there with Santos most of the time. But she was on call most of, the, most of that weekend. And she took me around. I went to church with her. I met her family, her, her son. We went to the marketplace. She... She bought me a beautiful um, sabana, and sabanas are like the sheets, the red blankets, and things of that nature. This is the one she made. Um, this is actually the one that I got um, from Christina and them. But the one she made for me is huge. It's really big. And as we go across through the PowerPoint, I'll talk more in detail about how they make those. But um, I was really close to Santos. And then Ophelia, she was the one that I, the midwife I knew the least. She wasn't really there very often because her daughter had epilepsy, so oftentimes she would have to leave to take care of her daughter. Okay, um, so let's talk a little bit about Mayan traditional beliefs and the notion of healing. So um, the Mayans have very interesting uh, religious um, spiritual beliefs. They believe in the heavenly earth and the underworld. And many gods reside over all these particular three re regions. So there's no clear separation between matter and the spirit. They also are very family-oriented people as well. So, and I love this about them. They have, they have such a, a communal a way of dealing with things, particularly with birth. Um, but, but particularly with illness, um, when you when a, um, a person in Guatemala gets ill, it's it's said to throw their, their, their body off balance, off kilter. Mm -hmm. That equilibrium is off essentially, and so the whole idea is to kind of maintain that state that state of homeostasis essentially. So when when they get inflicted with these types of illnesses, what can happen is it's caused by organic and physical conditions. So like poor diet, for example, lack of nutrition, not eating healthy, can be a, another issue that can lead to that contamination. One thing about Guatemala, you cannot drink the water. 
I don't know if any of you have you ever, have any of you ever been to Guatemala, right in America? Okay. Yeah. Oh, good. Belize, which is right next to Guatemala. Absolutely. So, um, and they, it, some of them speak Creole and and, and Belize. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, with, with the water, we had to particularly order, um, you know, um, you know, the clean filtered water because uh, it was really contaminated and we couldn't drink it. And I was sick as a dog, which is why I'll talk a little bit about some of the herbs that helped me make it through <laughs> when I was there. Um, but yes. So, and then the second class is caused by the supernatural spiritual forces, the concepts of the evil winds and I and, and Fusto and, and sight, which is fright. So we'll talk about that as well. So the concept of hot and cold, I believe Dr. Rapper talked about this earlier in the in the week during diversity impact, but um, the Mayans believe in this hot and cold complex, which is quite similar in Chinese culture as well. So it's interesting how many of these um, cultures are, are linked. Um, so essentially, uh, pregnancy is considered a very hot state. Mm -hmm. And so you have to keep the, the body very warm during pregnancy. So what they would do oftentimes is they would make this hot tea called Pepinula tea. And Pepinula actually helps kind of warm the body, warm the uterus, um, and the pelvic region here. And so you also have to prevent the mom during pregnancy from being exposed to any type of cold. So for example, the window couldn't be open. She had to have lots of covers on her body. She couldn't even t put her feet on the cold floor. So I had to rush and get the slippers and make sure that she wasn't touching the floor at all because um, you know, they had tile floors in, at a Canberra Center. So again, they couldn't eat certain cold foods, similar to Chinese culture, right? Um, and so again, teas and soups, wet foods and things of that nature was all they had to, to eat. So again, if the body goes into this cold state, it throws their body off balance. And again, an illness can be afflicted upon not only them, but the baby. That is the belief, okay? It's a very important case to take note of with regards to their, their culture. Okay, so my pregnancy and birth and postpartum taboos. I added this piece in here because I'm kind of fascinated by this myself with regards to taboos because, um, again, part, for part of my DMT research, I'm connecting this with relation to Caribbean rituals as well because it's very similar. So again, we talked about um, you know, them not being able to touch the cold floor, but also you have to, they have to be exposed to particular types of um, foods. But for example, when, when a mom has a craving, you want to definitely give her that food. And if you don't, it, it sets you up for illness upon the baby. Um, they also want to avoid getting the belly wet, which is interesting. I didn't know that initially. And so when I, I tried to <laughs> wash mom off on the belly, woo, got in trouble for that. They did not like that. So you definitely don't want to, put, um, you know, wet that belly up because it, again it's a, like a bad omen you just don't want to do that during pregnancy um and we talked about exposure to illnesses and things to that nature in the cold nights and cold sweat so what that means is um at night they have to cover up completely so they had um what they call the bufandas bufandas are scarves so they would put those over their heads and try to protect themselves from the cold wind because again it looks like with illness upon them so the evil eye, I have to talk a little bit about this because it's, it's common cross-culturally in the Caribbean as well. They talk about this in Haiti and um, uh, in, in different cultures as well in Africa, I believe. Um, so uh, in, in Espanol, the evil eye is called mal de ojo. And essentially, it's like this evil look or hot gaze that you give uh, a particular person. So for example, if, in my belief, that if, if a pregnant woman uh, has a hot gaze and looks like someone else's baby in admiration, it's said to inflict illness upon that child. So you want to be very cautious about how you look at other people's children in Guatemala. But to prevent the evil eye, and Asusuna was known for this, she would actually collect um, many of these herbs that you see here. Um, the first one is the Apso seeds. Again, this is Kachi, excuse me, the mom language. So um, if they pronounce it a little differently, but Apso seeds kind of look like an eye almost. And as you can see, they put it together and make a bracelet and they tie it around the baby. And this is supposed to ward off evil spirits, essentially. And then um, they also um, mix up this, this interesting herbal remedy here with ruta and lemon verbena and or orange leaf here. And they put it together and they make it into like a tea and, um, and then they drink it. And that's supposed to um, ward off the evil spirit. And Asusena was known for doing it. So they would come to her if they felt like the baby was, you know, inflicted with the evil eye, then they would ask for Asusena. And now another one is susto. Susto means like it's fright or any type of trauma that anyone uh, experiences essentially. And so as you can see here, these are the various different herbs that they would use to help ward off fright or trauma from a particular person. So by trauma, I mean, say for example, they, you know, one of their, their loved ones got hit by a car or you know had a tragic accident or something to that nature. Um, you would go to Asusena who would put together these remedies to help get rid of the, of the susto. Um, 
So essentially, I just wanted to highlight this in more detail. So what Asu Sanya would do is she would kind of mix up these teas and then she'd put it into like this, this large bowl. And she also like mix, mix it up a little bit in the cup and she would drink a little bit of it and then she starts spitting on the on the person. And I know it seems a little awkward, but essentially it is something about this, this technique that helped to ward off the evil spirit. So as you can see in this picture, they're kind of spitting a little bit on the woman. It's interesting, but it, it's part of, of, of their culture and their spiritual um, tradition. Okay, so massages. So massages are massages. Um, I love these massages. And Tamina was actually known for the, the massages in um, Guatemalan culture. Essentially what she would do, the, the woman would come in and she'd be in a lot of pain. And you know how when you're pregnant and you feel weighted down, it's a lot of pressure here in the lower pelvic region. Well, she would lay down this mom, she'd rub her hands with some Vaseline, and she'd start manipulating the abdomen, and the mother would feel so much better. It's interesting, during this time period, I actually saw a manual um, external cephalic version. Fascinating. I don't know, has any of you, have any of you ever seen this? It's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's different than how they do it in, in the States. Because here in the States, they bring mom in, she's 36 weeks, she's under your boobs, they give her to butylane, they look at it under the ultrasound and try and turn the baby with the, the obstetrician does that. But in Guatemalan culture, um, the midwife should bring the woman in. I remember she was 28 weeks, and um, she she asked me. I was standing there. I'm not sure. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. I think it's your name tag. I think your name tag. Oh, okay. Okay. Let me take that off. Um, awesome. Thank you so much. Can you hear me now better? Okay, great. Um, so essentially, what would happen when um, she came in? She was 28 weeks, right? And so she said she was it's lying on the table and and she said she would do it we're doing the um uh leopold maneuver and i was trying to feel for the baby's head and she said don't let that like a cabeza and i said wow like the cabeza is not down here I said, it's, it's up here so the baby was reached right it was, i was pointing to the top part of the avenue and she said ah see so she went over and she grabbed this um the, the vaseline again and she started manipulating the abdomen and enchanting in mom and mom again is a, a traditional Mayan language. And I was like, what is she saying? I asked Sarah. Sarah didn't know because again, we don't understand the, the Mayan language. And then afterwards, we asked her. So she, we said, what? What did you say to that mom? She said, oh, I was talking to the baby. I was telling the baby the drawer's not at the bottom. I mean, excuse me, drawer's not at the bottom. And so she was manually <laughs> <laughs> to move the baby down. And so when we did Leopold that second time. The baby's head was at the bottom. You know, the baby. Wow. Fascinating. And so I'd never seen anything like that. So I wrote a story about that. I wrote a paper about that. It was very interesting. Um, so that is how important those um, massages are. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some of the Mayan traditional birth practices here. So we talked a little bit about um, the massages and things of that nature. We also didn't highlight the vaginal, uh, washing of the vaginal area. So that's a very interesting, it's a, a very important in Mayan tradition. It helps clean in, uh, the vaginal area um, in, um, during pregnancy and even in the postpartum period. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as we move along as well. So postpartum rituals. Now it's interesting, in postpartum, massages are really important because the whole purpose of this is to help that uterus contract, right? And to, to stop that bleeding as well. So they do a lot of those postpartum. Now it's interesting, they also give specific types of herbs to help expel the placenta. Um, uh, and, and we'll talk about that as we go along. And then in addition to that, they have this informal way of doing the APGAR scores, but they still kind of had their own way of doing the reflexes. They check for respiratory weight, vital signs, all those things. And then it's interesting. You see how I have these onions at the bottom here? Well, they, they live by these onions. Let me tell you, there was this time period when this woman was dealing with, um, uh, I think she was has seizing. And it was it was right uh, towards the end of my training there. And I remember the first thing they went out to grab was this onion. And they put it up under the woman's nose, and she's like convulsing and things of that nature. And as soon as they put it up, it, she kind of like came out of this trance. It was amazing. And they, so they use this onion quite often to help with the, to stimulate the, the senses, to open up the, the oxygen, um, the, the respiratory pathway. So it's fascinating how it works, but they live by it. Um, and essentially, I love the fact that they practice delayed cord cramping in Guatemala. So they wait till the cord stops pulsing before they cut and, and clamp the cord, and then they tie it off with this cotton string. Now, uh, the first time I did it, when I was there, I tied it one time, but, but and I got yelled at by Christine. She said, no, no, cuatro, cuatro. She said, tie it four times. So it has to be really, really tight, really tight, because, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to make sure that doesn't come off. Um, and so you want to 
They also weigh and measure the baby, and they practice skin to skin, which I'm a huge advocate of. And for many of our, you know, breastfeeding uh, ones who's focused on that, we love skin to skin contact, which is fascinating. So good for the baby. Okay, so postpartum rituals and practices. Let's talk a little bit more about this. So breastfeeding, you're a huge advocate of breastfeeding. Um, oftentimes, um, the women would walk around with these, these savannas, and they would put these kind of wraps around them in such a way. Now, this isn't um, as long, so I can't really demonstrate this for you. But can I have a, a volunteer really quickly? Because um, I want to show, just, just to give an example of how they kind of hold this up. Thank you so much, Johanna. I really appreciate that. Okay, so essentially, with the Sabanas, Sabanas, thank you. They would kind of put them on like so, and then this isn't long enough, but if it was long, they would tie it in such a way so it's crisscrossed in the front mm -hmm. like that, and then tie it again behind, and then the baby would be in the back, essentially. So that's kind of how it would be. Okay, and they would walk around with the baby like that. Thank you so much, Johanna. And then um, what, what they would also do is swing the baby to the side, and then they could also initiate breastfeeding as they're walking on the go, and things of that nature. So it was fascinating. I'd love to see it. And they, we often we incorporate many of these same um, techniques here in the States now because they're using a lot of the baby carriers and the as well. So thank you for that. Okay. So yes, ha I was happy to see that they were there breastfeeding on the three. Now, the rebozos. I did not bring a rebozo with me today. Unfortunately, I tried to pack as much as I could, and I and I, I thank Lena for driving me here because I had this huge <laughs> bag. So I was trying to bring all my, my, my props. But I did bring a scarf. So I wanted to show you the rebozo technique. Now, I know a lot of people probably practice this here in the States now. Can I get another volunteer? It's okay. Anybody? No? Okay, thank you so much. Awesome. So let me just show you a little bit about what they do with these rebozos. Now, essentially, with the rebozo technique, we're probably going to need a little chair here. So I want you to just kind of, now picture, you know, remind me of your name again. Ronnie. Okay, Ronnie, thank you so much. So Ronnie's pregnant, right? So you're going to bend over like so and kind of lean over on him. Like perfect, just like that. And so with the rebozo technique, if she's pregnant, this will go up underneath the abdomen like so, and kind of you know, pull back the legs a little bit. Perfect. And so I'm going to kind of stand in between her like so, and I'm doing this essentially to rotate the baby, mm -hmm. as you can see. And what it also does is kind of lift up her pelvis slightly, mm -hmm. so it takes that pressure off, mm -hmm. and she's we're also moving and manually manipulating that baby. Okay? And so this is a common technique. Yeah, thank you so much, Ryan. That, that they do in Guatemala. They also do it in, excuse me, so very, very popular, and they still do it here now in the States. But it works better, again, when you're pregnant, you can pull up that, that uterus there. Um, okay, so we're moving right along here. So that is the rebozo. Now, the sabanas, we talked about that a little bit. They're beautifully made, and we'll highlight that in more detail as we go along. So this is the tribute that I wanted to give to the Guatemalans because they, they make such beautiful um, pieces of work and it's made on the backstrap wounds. So as you can see, I'll pass this around, but this is actually called a hipule. And it's and again, it's in Cachacal and Mom, how they pronounce it. But isn't this gorgeous? Mm -hmm. And they make this using the, the backstrap wounds. Okay, so I'll talk more in detail about these as we go, but I'll pass this around so you can see it. Okay. So the back strap wounds, they include two sticks with a strap. So as you can see here, these are the sticks here, and it's attached, attached to one side. And then one part is strapped up at the top, it's usually to a tree. This is the old indigenous um, uh, art pieces that I wanted to put in here so you can see the, the combination of from back in the day to now and how they still use it the same way. Essentially, it would be tied like so, and then they would sit on either a stool or this basket um, kind of seat here and needle, and then they would start to weave the actual um, material here. And they use, it's interesting how they use the dye. They use fruit from berries um, and dye from indigo, and they mix it together to get the colors. So it's fascinating when you see this happen. And I actually got it on footage. Because <laughs> I knew no one would believe me. I said, no one's going to believe how, how they make this. So I wanted to show you. I have it on my phone, so I'm going to pass this around. And you'll see Santos in my phone making the backstrap room. She's making the cover. I don't have it with me because it was too big. I couldn't bring it on the plane. It was over 50 pounds. 
So, but it's, <laughs> but it's huge, and it's, it's and it's about the same colors as this one in here. Because I was so fascinated by these beautiful, intricate rainbow colors that I see here. So I'm going to pass this around. I'm, I know I passed it on on this side already, but please don't. You can play that as we go. So that is how they make those 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 backstrap looms, and I'm fascinated by it. It's beautiful. And so um, we'll move along as we go throughout the presentation here. So the fajas, you can turn it down just a little bit. If you can. Thank you so much. Okay, now the fajas are interesting. These are actually a faja. Now fajas, have you heard of the abdominal wraps that we do postpartum? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, so important. And again, this is another cross-cultural link. So in, in the Caribbean, in the Bahamas, where my people are from, and I have some folks in Trinidad. I know there was a sister from Trinidad from before, I don't know if she's still here, but yes. So what they do, a postpartum, is they wrap the belly. And essentially what that does here, after you have a baby, of course your diastasis, rect diastasis recti muscles are stretched out, right? And so the whole purpose is to try to bring those muscles back in, those abdominal muscles. So what they do <coughs> is they use this faja wrap to keep that abdominal, to keep those abdominal muscles in, to help it close. And essentially because postpartum is also a very interesting state, it's considered a hot state as well, you also want to keep the body closed. Because the whole idea is after you have birth, you have to give birth, the body's open and more susceptible to what winds and colds, infection. So we want to keep it closed up. So essentially, can I have one more balance here? <laughs> I got one balance here today, huh? Awesome. Thank you. You're close. I'll bow <laughs> Okay, awesome. <laughs> Great. So this is the faja. So I'm going to demonstrate for you how this works. Now, I have to say, the faja, this is actually a shorter version of the faja because there actually was a longer one. I'm just kind of standing here on the front to make it see perfect. Thank you so much, Patricia. Okay, so hold this for me on the side mm -hmm. and hold it real tight because I'm going to make this real tight, okay? <laughs> All right. So essentially what they do is going to be tight. Real tight. Pull over. Real tight, right? What and get, what this does is <laughs> pulls in the diastasis recti muscles, as you can see, right? <laughs> and again, this isn't, this isn't the this isn't the, the, the this is the shorter version. This, there's a longer version of this. And they usually do two of them, essentially. And so, again, I didn't tie that as this, but it was like so. Or they would pin it. Wow, you lost my feet. Yeah, and so it kind of brings it in. It helps those devices represent the pain. But in Guatemala, which is different from how they do in the Caribbean, they use two of these. So not just one here, but they also put a second one mm -hmm. here to kind of keep that mm -hmm. pelvis in, right? So essentially, that's how they use the product. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. much Richard. I really appreciate that. Okay. So I'll pass this around as well. <laughs> 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 okay. So the traditional Hawaiian Tamascal. So I have to give tribute to these because I had a fascinating experience in this. Now, the Tamascals are similar to the Native American sweat lodges. Has anyone ever seen one or been in one? <laughs> yes. okay, awesome. So they're, they're incredible. And so as, I have to say, this is what the Mexican Tamascal looks like in comparison to the Guatemalan Tamascal. So as you can see, back in the day, they used to be made of adobe. But now they're made of cement, and it kind of has like this triangular roof. And it's almost like a fireplace inside, essentially. And what they would do, they would heat it up, put the wood in there and things of that nature. And then they also put a boiling pot of boiling water in there with herbs. And they would use different types of herbs. And the herbs that they would use is eucalyptus, they would use chamomile, different ones that are good for healing and calming and things of that nature. And they would wait, let it get really hot and then wait till the steam starts to come out. And so what would happen is after that fire goes out, then they close the door and you're in there with the steam. And it's, whoo, it's incredible. <laughs> I went in there with Santos, his, well, the day that she was on call, I was totally naked, so I was a little nervous, because I was like, oh my God. This is midwife, she's seeing all my private parts, but it's, but it's okay. So I had a good time, and she was, she was in there, she was giving me a massage, rubbing me down, and with this um, Haban Negro. And Haban Negro is the traditional Guatemalan soap. We'll talk about that a little bit as we go along as well. And she's rubbing me down with that, and then she's also using this particular type of, it's like a plant herb called chosix. And chosix, they slap it on you as they, as they give you the massage. And it actually has healing properties to help rejuvenate your body. And so and it's good for cramps, it's, it's good for um, pre pregnancy, postpartum, it kind of rejuvenates, like opens up your pillows, it's good for sinuses and allergies. 
And so when I came out, oh my God, I was like a whole new person. It was amazing. <laughs> like my skin was red. I had an afro like this, and my hair was like this. <laughs> I, was, I, was, um, I was amazed. It was, it was an incredible experience. So I encourage you, if you ever get go to Guatemala, if you ever go to Mexico, go inside the Tamascal. It's a rejuvenating, a, a, a exhilarating, feeling ex experience. Um, it's one of the best things that I ever had. So definitely. And and um, you, you can go in there with other, other people, you know, your, your husband, your partner, whoever it may be. Um, they, sometimes they even bring their kids in there. It's, it's wonderful. Okay, so vaginal steam bath. Again, this is another cross-cultural link. I've been highlighting that throughout the presentation. So they do this also in the Caribbean as well. But with the vaginal steam baths, um, oftentimes they'll do this either in the Tamascal or they'll get like a, a separate um, big, big bowl after they boil it under some hot water and they put the herbs inside the, the bowl and let the steam kind of rise up. And the midwife kind of stands in front of the mom and she's hovered over the the bowl like so, and she blows into the vaginal area. And again, the steam um, from these herbal remedies is actually good for the perineum. It helps with vaginal lacerations and things of that nature after episiotomies um, and C-section wounds and things of that nature as well for some women. So they also come to these midwives for just to get a vaginal steam bath. It's also good for like endometriosis, um, you know, postpartum uh, issues. Um, just wonderful, fascinating administration. Really good. So this is the Habana Negro. And as you can see, I actually took this from my own camera um, in Guatemala. So <laughs> this is the soap, and it's actually in the laundry room. So this is the laundry um, bin that they would have here. And this is actually laundry detergent. <laughs> so essentially, it's about the size of a grapefruit, and it's made out of lime, lard, and ashes. And it has very wonderful healing properties. And they make it in this 55-gallon um, drum. And then they, they cook it over a fire, and they roll it, and roll it until it becomes this big ball. And it's real slippery. So, I mean, in the time of it kept slipping and falling. And I was like, oh, God. You know, so <laughs> that's interesting. But I had a good time. Um, so, but anyway, it's, it's really good for you because it actually cleanses your body really wonderfully. It's an antibacterial type of soap. And they, and it's only, you can only get it in Guatemala. I tried to take it back with me. And I was so mad. They went in my suitcase. They took it out. Oh, I was so upset because there was a lot of herbs that I had wanted to bring back. But, again, when you're traveling like that and bringing different types of herbs into the States, they don't let you bring certain things. So they took my soap, y'all. You know, they took my soap. <laughs> so, you know, I don't have it, but I'd rather even go back and tell, you know, until I get some more until I go back. But essentially, it's amazing if you ever get your hands on it. Okay, so now we're going to make transition. How many? How much time do I have? Do I still have a little time? Yeah. Um, so we're going to make transition into the herbal piece of the, the presentation. This is Asusena, her beautiful herbal garden, and we're going to go through the various different herbs that um, I really had to take pictures, and, and um, this was the hardest part of, of the ethnographic research because I had to literally, um, you know, translate everything and from Spanish to English with the help of my preceptor and take pictures and try to line everything up. So it was really hard, a lot of work. But anyway, um, the Mayan traditional herbal healing remedies for pregnancy. So I talked about Pimpinela. Pimpinela is the, the most famous one that they use quite often. This is a mixture of all these herbs, uh, the Pimpinela pericon and the chamomile, and it helps the uterus. Kind of similar to uh, lint raspberry leaf. You know how it helps the uterine tone, kind of strengthens that uterine tone. Same type of method here, um, but they use it um, in Guatemala. And I think Pimpinela is indigenous to Guatemala. I tried looking for it here. I tried even looking on the internet to try and see if I could order it, but they don't. They don't even have it here. Um, so it's really good. Now, urban morena is also really good too. That's good for um, iron. So, for example, if mom has, has really low iron levels, they often give her that too, and that's also good for diabetes. Now, the, the remedies for labor and birth. So, it's interesting. When I was um, working with the midwives in Guatemala during labor, they make this really interesting cornmeal. It kind of looks like porridge almost, and it, it's sweet, but it's got a kick to it, uh, <laughs> if you can imagine. So, the kick comes from the chili peppers, uh, the pimienta chapa. And it makes it, woo, really spicy, but yet it's sweet at the same time. So it's like a weird sensation. But essentially, they also put a little bit of ginger in there. And I'll pass this around. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this ginger, too, because <laughs> I, I have to share this, and forgive me. But when I was in Guatemala, I got really sick at one point. Um, because, again, they don't have the same medications that we have here in the States. So I was looking for my night roll. They didn't have it. But I'm telling you, they, they made me all these different herbs. But the only thing that saved my life was this ginger, man. I had it every day. The ginger tea, I'd have it cold, I'd have it hot, um, and I would mix it a little bit because Sarah was really good at herbal remedy. So she would mix it with um, coriander, which is really cilantro, and a cardamom, and a little bit of nutmeg. But you have to be careful 
Because if you put too much nutmeg in it, because um, nutmeg has sedative qualities, so if you put too much of it in it, nutmeg will knock you right out. So I put a little too much nutmeg in it, and I didn't wake up till 12 o'clock. I missed the word. <laughs> I didn't mean to, but it was, it, you know, I had a little too much. But essentially, this is what saved me when I was there. There was this mixture of this ginger, the cardamom, the cilantro, and the nutmeg, and that helped me. Because I tell you, the diarrhea was unbelievable because it's terrible. You can't drink the water. But again, it helps so much when you have those herbs. So they saved my life. So anyway, moving right along here to the Anansi seed. And this is the other one here that's indigenous to Guatemala. And again, forgive me for the pronunciation. Xpoc, but they say it way differently than that. And I'm, I know I'm messing that up approximately, but that's kind of how, how it's somewhat pronounced. But again, this is a particular type of herb indigenous to their region that they only have, and they put it in um, this particular porridge, really good for the body. Okay, so my holistic herbal remedies in the postpartum period. Interestingly, they use a lot of the same ones we use here in the States. Feverfew, yarrow, I mean, we use all these for primarily for our moms. Um, the other one's interesting, why not they baca? It also, uh, actually helps with blood clotting. So if moms have a whole lot of clots postpartum, they give uh, a lot of this type of tea with the lango de baca. And they basically put it in some water, they steam it, and then they give it to the mom like so. And then um, chosics. This is, this, this is what they would be hitting me with inside the Tamascal. So they break off a piece of the branch and then slap me down and then massage me with the chopsticks. And again, that's a, a mom terminology, a term, term right here. And then we have the uh, traditional breastfeeding herbs. So ixbu, again, another mom word. Um, but uh, Asif saying that was also the equivalent to what our CLCs would be here in the States. She was one of those in uh, Guatemala. So she loved breastfeeding. She had several ixbu plants in her, in her house and also at the birth center. So um, this was quite a, a, a little bit of everywhere um, within the garden. And then they also use fennel as well. And again, this uh, many of these help with the stimulation of milk production. So it's fascinating, but um, these are the ones that they use. Now, I have to say, when I was in Guatemala, the most common primary concern that many of these women had was urinary tract infections. And again, they don't have access to a lot of the, the uh, antibiotics that we have here in the States. And so they would come to these, these women would come to um, these um, comadronas to get these particular herbs to help treat the UTIs. And so essentially they would use, I love this, this, this term, not this term, chichicaste. And that, that's really what, it, what, what that term is means is nettles. And so they put that together and also dandelion leaves. Now I have some here because I love dandelion leaves. I don't know if any of you, have, have any of you ever tried dandelion leaves or have them? They're amazing. Um, I think it's nature's herb because it's, uh, essentially it's good for cancer, it's good for diabetes, high cholesterol, UTI, I mean, you name it. Um, please, if you can, get some dandelion in your life because it helps put it on your salads, um, make a tea out of it, whatever you can do. Because it's, to yes, absolutely. It's so, it's so good for you. So please have some dandelion leaves. And then they also use shepherd's purse a lot, and that was also really good for it. And interestingly, I didn't know this. I learned something totally new about this herb here, corn silk. They put a little bit of corn silk and boil it with a mixture of these and it helps fight off infections. They drink it for about a week and then the UTI is gone afterwards. It makes you pee it out basically. Okay, so that's pretty much what's happening. Now, last but not least here, um, I wanted to just highlight some interesting um, interventions that we can do. And this is the, this is the piece that kind of help, ties into the diversity impact and the health disparities. Because in Guatemala, the women are, are not treated very well. There's a lack of respect for women because it's a very male-dominated, patriarchal society, basically. Um, and essentially, there's a lot of discrimination and oppression that these my, my midwives have to deal with. Um, so they're, they're not really very respected in the, the city uh, when you go out to Guatemala and things of that nature by the Latinos. So essentially, uh, what we need to do to help improve maternal and child health care in Guatemala, <coughs> we need to focus on increasing um, sexual health and education because they don't have a lot of that in where they're, where they're located, um, particularly in the rural community. We also need to increase government funding and expenditures geared towards maternal and child health because a lot of that funding goes towards farming because they're known for, again, uh, they have one of the best fruits and, and you know, uh, vegetables and things of that nature and it's a huge export business that they have there in Guatemala. But essentially, a lot of the, the funding doesn't go to the, the things that they needed to, particularly maternal and child health. Um, so these women are dying, and we need to do something about that, right? Mm -hmm. um, they also need midwifery training programs. 
they they have a few programs in uh, a few programs in um, Concepcion to Cure Chapa, Chapa, but essentially they are spoken in the language of the native Indian indigenous, indigenous um, minds. So, for example, they'll bring out um, these trainers from you know Guatemala City who speak either Espanol or speak English, but all the the, the women in this location speak Cachical or Ma. So they can't understand half the things that they're saying. And there's no materials within the indigenous language <coughs> so that they, they can hand out. So they can't even take it home and, and translate all these things here. So essentially, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. So they, they need to, again, another health disparity that we're dealing with in the community. Do they have a written language on I think that there is, there is part of the written language in Kachikau, but I don't know about mom. They, right. I haven't seen anything written down, but it's just part of their indigenous culture. Right. Yeah, but Kachikau, I think there is, there is um, Part of that is written down. That's the one in Tisunana that they they that they speak. Um, but yes, absolutely. And then we're moving right along here to pediatric care and contraception. So I have to say that in Guatemala, um, many of the women who I came across were either Jehovah Witness or Catholic. And so again, a, a lot of Catholic based on their religion, that many of them are pro-life. They don't believe in contraception. But then there are others who might still need to get access to some of these services. They may not feel comfortable telling their family members, so they might have to, to go out in the community to get reproductive health care, um, but they don't have access to it in the rural community. And I have to say, Concepcion Chiquiri Chapa is about four hours from you know the major hospital, if not more, if you don't have access to a car so, or a bus. Um, so again, it's a huge barrier there, trying to get to the, the nearest city even, um, to get access to some of these materials. And then also medications and birth supplies. We had birth the first baby that I, and I have to say, with the help of my preceptor, I delivered my first baby in Guatemala. But um, I was not under frontiers, you know, you know <laughs> I was in four frontier. But um, essentially, when it happened, baby was born to call, um, baby came out, FRs were really low. Um, basically, really lethargic, baby was blue, barely breathing. Um, my, the, Sarah had to do um, neonatal resuscitation on the baby. I was listening to heart tones, terrible. We, we thought we were going to lose this baby. And I'm looking at everywhere with the Ambu bag, no Ambu bag in the room, no materials, nothing. And so, again, they, they have the lack of access to many of these birth supplies. And so they need many of these materials in the birth center setting. So part of what Nicole May does, she helps, when we go to these ATM birth centers, the money that we spend on some of these things when, when the midwives come, goes straight to the midwives so that they can use it to get some of these birth supplies. And so essentially that's how they're trying to help these women at ATM birth centers. Um, and also medications. A lot of the antibiotics that they have are outdated. That was part of my job when I was there as a volunteer nurse. I, I had to count some of the medications and make sure that they were up to date. And the moxicillin was out of, out of date, the rifamycin. I mean, they were giving these women, you know, out, out, outdated meds. And that's unacceptable, right? We need to have better, better access to these medications. So that's a huge issue as well in the community. Um, and then networking and collaborating with other with, with other doctors and obstetricians in Guatemala City is an issue too. Because again, when these midwives come into the city, they have no respect for them. It's terrible. They shun them, they look down on them, with lack of education and things of that nature. They, they don't even listen to these women. And so they, they need more support. There needs to be more of that network, that camaraderie, that connection amongst the obstetricians in the hospital and the, the indigenous women midwives. Um, and then more certification programs. I have to say that when the midwives finally do get certified in um, Concepcion to Kiritapa, their certification isn't even recognized in, in Guatemala City. So they can't even practice. Crazy, right? Ridiculous. It, it's, it's, a, it's a problem. And so again, another more part of these health disparities that we're dealing with in the community. And so I, I challenge you all, once you become midwives and practitioners, or even if you already are, go out <laughs> and you know join some of these organizations and help not only help in, in your community, but also help globally. So we can support some of these uh, these cultures in underdeveloped countries. Um, questions? Should we take questions now or wait till the end? Um, you can give ten more minutes. Okay, I have a video to show. But okay, James, did you have a question? I was going to say, do these midwives do they have issues with like they have a partnership with pharmaceutical companies? Yes, they do because a lot of times they don't speak the language, so they can't even translate when they're trying to contact the you know the states or even for the pharmacy. But what Nicole May does. She's part like like that liaison. So she kind of talks to many of the, the pharmacy, the doctors, and can help them so that they can send some of the materials down to them. And she basically, um, she works in collaboration with Antonina because Antonina is the only one, her and Melvin, who speaks English. So that's a good question. But yeah, they, there's only maybe three three of them who do it all together. So good question. Yeah, to me.
Um, I'm, I'll take one more, but I want to show this quick video. Okay. Um, I just had a question about the culture as far as it being very um, pa patriarchal, but mm -hmm. um, uh, what was I going to say? Like in India, what you see sometimes as far as the woman not having control over her health care decisions and stuff, when she gets married, usually she becomes a part of obviously the husband's family. Mm -hmm. yes. And then in that case, a lot of times you see mother in laws actually having a lot of control of health care decision making, especially when the woman's pregnant. Um, does that also happen in Guatemala? Yes, it does, absolutely. So when the mom gets married, um, essentially she kind of marries into the family. So basically, she doesn't really have any say. The husband's family has say. So the husband's mom dictates everything that happens with the mom. Absolutely. Good point. I didn't, I failed to mention that. So uh, essentially, that's part of that whole family dynamic, that, that, that patriarchal system there. So the father's family dictates what happens with the mom during the labor process. So even if the mom doesn't want to do a certain technique or, you know, wants to leave or whatever it may be, if, if the father's family, and it's usually the father's mom, if she, if she says, nope, she's staying, then she has to stay. And again, it's, it's part of that patriarchal system that they, they live in. So great point. Thank you so much, Dr. Two, for mentioning that. So last but not least, Elliot, thank you so much. I just want to show this quick video just to give you an idea of the traditional Maya midwives and their Akin birth center. <laughs> The midwife in Guatemala is considered a sacred person. She is probably the most respected person in her community. La comadrona Maya es una mujer que ha luchado para salvar la vida de la madre y del bebé. Esa es ayuda estamos dando a las mujeres mayas aquí en Concepción, Chiclichapa. The Midwife Center has created a lot of respect. It's really become the hub of the community in Concepción. No formarnos en el sentido occidental, sino que seguirnos formando en nuestra cultura y que nuestra cultura no se pierda. At the end of the Guatemalan Civil War, a group of traditional midwives in the village of Concepcion Chiquirichapa and the neighboring village of San Juan Ostencalco banded together around some common problems that they were experiencing. Over 80% of the births in the whole country were being done by indigenous Maya midwives. However, there was no mechanism to pay these midwives. They had no access to the equipment they needed to carry out their work or medicines, they had no communication. They spoke their Maya languages and were in a culture that expected them to speak Spanish. Éramos un grupo de comadronas unidas, un grupo de comadronas que veníamos de diferentes lados a capacitarnos en el centro de salud. No teníamos un carnet como identificarnos. So all of this led them to do a very brave thing and form a group of their own to try to find their own solutions. At about that time, a couple who had fled the village during the war and had been given sanctuary in Vermont returned to the village. They brought another midwife with them, Judy Luce. They met up with Antonina Sanchez, who was the leader of the ACOM group, and Antonina whispered in her ear, what we really want is a place of our own. And they thought maybe renting a room where they could uh, have enough room that the 40 midwives in that area could meet and consolidate their traditional knowledge, their plant knowledge, and the resources that they had. Money was raised, the plans were donated, and this beautiful birth center took shape. It's a full midwife center. It's about 5,000 square feet, it has three floors. It's very traditional. Everything is done the traditional way. When they come in, they're treated you know, like royalty. Um, they have private rooms, the whole family is there, they have the birth, there's a sweat lodge that they can go in afterwards. Gracias a Dios que les de la casa, ahora sí vamos a estar en este casas que dijeron. Fue un 17 de junio en el 2004 donde se celebró esta casa y decía yo es increíble ver esta casa y decía yo será que estoy soñando me, me tocaba los ojos y decía estoy soñando o es una realidad.
and returned the midwife center over to the council. So it's totally owned and, and run by them. We raise money in the states and keep it going, and 40% of the overhead is actually um, generated by themselves. And that's the problem with most NGOs in the third world. Um, you know, they'll come in, it's our way or the highway, we're providing the money, we know better than you. It just doesn't work that way. From the beginning, the people who got involved began by listening, by understanding that this was not our country and that we didn't have an agenda. So the agenda was formed by the midwives themselves. The building is theirs, the equipment, everything is theirs. We just legally turned it over to them. They're all in the salary, they're all paid. If they weren't working as midwives at the center, uh, they'd be uh, in the fields. Um, so many of their kids go to school uh, because they can afford the money for books. I think the poverty that you see there is not a depraved poverty. They have an intact culture that they have fought very hard to maintain, and their language and their customs are essential to their ability to really have a decent life in spite of everything that's happened to them. La comadrona Maya también es consejera y también ella apoya mucho a las madres o a las mujeres. Y también ella tiene mucho cariño a las mujeres embarazadas y entonces la comadrona Maya, ella es muy importante. Es una, es una mujer líder en la comunidad. Cuando la gente son como que no tienen o sea, esos descasos recursos, eh, nosotros los ayudamos. Con ellas. Cuando hay mujeres embarazadas, no tiene dinero para comprar medicamentos. Estamos regalando pastillas prenatales, otras pastillas para ayudar a la mujer embarazada. Esa es la ayuda que está dando acá. Many of the, the things that they use are effective and cost very little. There's a plant, for instance, that grows like a weed all around the village that's extremely high in iron. And so the midwives uh, provide that for the pregnant women. And we don't see problems of anemia, which is, has been a factor in some of the high maternal mortality rates elsewhere in the country. Siempre hemos trabajado con plantas medicinales. También estamos luchando un poco ahora con las madres para que no coman muchas chatarras. <laughs> Pero la importancia de la comadrona maya es que ella habla el mismo idioma con las mujeres. En el hospital han dicho que no vayan con las comadronas, pero como la mayoría de las señoras no hablan el español, Por eso no van al hospital, sino que acuden más con las comadronas. Hay más relación con la comadrona Maya y con la, con la mujer embarazada. Guatemala spends less than 1% of its GDP on health care for the whole country. Most of the services provided are concentrated in the capital. So the people in the indigenous areas are very much on their own. If everybody were to suddenly go to the hospital, it would be overwhelmed. The hospital is often less well equipped than our little birth center. And doctors cost a lot more money than midwives. Western medicine isn't just thrown out. We really try and, and meld the two together using the best of both worlds. If somebody needed surgery, if we did an ultrasound, we could see that this needed to be a C-section. Uh, we would write everything up and then have that um, patient sent to the local hospital. So the objective is to make it sort of the hub of a, of a wheel. And the spokes will be these uh, small little, maybe one room clinics that'll be in the villages in the mountainous region. Computers, cell phones, this, uh, began to solve some of the problems that they were facing. Because they often don't speak Spanish, but rather their Maya language, they've never been able to demonstrate to the medical community what they know. So one interesting thing that happened through a small grant that we obtained was some very sophisticated uh, medical models and computers so that these midwives could demonstrate for the first time to the physicians in their community what they knew. And the physicians were astonished. 
They have a great status in the community through their position as a midwife. And the clinic, I think, has added another dimension to that in that they have now gained the respect of the municipal officials and of the medical community. They did not have that before. They see both the facility and the midwives now as an asset. Nosotros ayudamos en lo que es los consultas, en lo que es planificación familiar, nuestras embarazadas, eh, controles prenatales y también capacitando comadronas. Es una institución pues muy buena, sinceramente muy buena porque aquí hay comadronas de mucha experiencia y muy bien capacitada. Tenemos aquí cerca a San Juan Ostuncalco, a pesar de que son comunidades muy cercas, ahí tenemos ya como más o menos lo que va del año ya dos muertes maternas y porque no tiene ningún centro permanente pues de lo que sea capacitación de comadronas en cambio acá con este centro se ha evitado eso acá está ya estuvo capacitando a nuevas jóvenes comadronas entonces yo creo que es un logro que se ha hecho para que ellas no dejan de, de morir en nuestra cultura como estudiantes y como practicantes de acá, de, de acá muy, muy contentas, felices de, de haber em, empezado a formarnos como comadronas mayas, ya que en nuestras comunidades las comadronas que están ya, tienen, ya son abuelas, entonces como nosotras ya jóvenes queremos seguir rescatando la medicina, las costumbres, todo lo que Nuestros pueblos han estado trabajando desde, desde nuestra cultura. Me gusta conocer lo que es el trabajo de comadrona y me ha interesado bastante. A mí me gusta ayudar lo que es mi gente porque lo que vivimos aquí en Guatemala casi todos somos pobres, no tenemos dinero. I think ACOM has definitely empowered women. They, they empowered themselves and they attracted the people they needed and the resources they needed. And I think it's that they are just an incredible group of women. Antonina, with her third grade education, was picked to represent the whole department of Quetzaltenango in the Residential Committee on the Rights of Women. So they're expanding not only with their midwifery skills and knowledge, they're trying to make it a really indigenous approach. and addressing much, much more than, than just the obstetric needs of the women they take care of. Hemos tenido la formación política, ya sabemos defendernos cuando hemos sido a veces discriminadas por ser mujeres mayas. Gracias a Dios y al esfuerzo de todos, de todos ustedes. Es una historia muy larga, muy, muy grande, y a la vez muy triste, y a la vez muy, muy alegre. These women have been empowered and they're taking that empowerment and they're saying, this is what we can do. This is what you do when you organize and you get some help. It's been very encouraging to see how these shy, sort of very passive women have become real fighters for, for their own rights and for the rights of children. so much. I have a few pictures just to show you and then I can take a few questions before we start out with the next presentation. So these are just some of the pictures of me uh, at ACAM Birth Center. This is me and Christina. Um, this is a picture of the birth center setting there. This is Sarah. She's Sarah Prichelle. She's awesome. She's very wonderful, open. I remember the first time I she told me about the, to, to deliver a baby. She said, how else you going to figure it out unless you go in there and do it? Go ahead, go ahead, go in there and test the baby. And I was like, okay. So she's amazing. And uh, this is the Dr. Van. She's actually, um, she's Vietnamese and she's from California. She's fluent in Espanol and comes often. She did her residency um, in Guatemala as well uh, as a study abroad project too. So she was also down here with us as well. And these are a group of all the women we went out to lunch that day. This is Antonia doing a massage on a young lady here. This is her in the herbal garden. And this is actually the women, I went to a women's rights march um, when I was down here because Asusena is actually one of the leaders of the community and she helped kind of um, get the women together to, to march in this wonderful uh, event. 
and I actually went to support them. So I was there on the signs and marching with them. It was amazing. Um, and so these are some of the pictures from that. This is one of the babies that we that delivered. Um, they got both me and Sarah. Um, it's so cute. And then this is this is on Sassena in the herbal garden, and that's that's me right there. So. Uh, it was an amazing experience. I had a great time. I would love to go back um, uh, once I get this degree. And there's so many things we can do with it globally. But um, I encourage you all to, to definitely get out and, 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 and be, be a part of IC, ICM, the International Confederation of Midwives. Um, get involved with your communities and um, give back not only uh, where you're located, but also um, globally as well. Uh, so thank you so much for this opportunity. <laughs> I was there for about four months. Oh, wow. Yeah, and so I could take off work, take do, take leave actually um, for a significant amount of time and uh, get to go and do this experience. But I really wanted to get some, some more uh, opportunities and enter part of abroad because you have more you have more opportunities to deliver when you're abroad than you're not. Um, I'm not sure who is next. Um, is that Sure. Go ahead. Uh, is congenital Zika really a concern for the Midwest? Say it again. Congenital Zika virus. You know what? They didn't talk about that when I was down there. I don't think yeah, it, it, it was. Yeah, it was 2014. I don't think it had virus. Since then, if it's. Um, I know it's in the Caribbean, particularly for Puerto Rico. It's, it has a high um, uh, rate of the Zika virus um, and, and many other parts of the, of the Caribbean as well. But they hadn't mentioned it in Guatemala when I was there. Um, I'd have to do some more research to see whether it's affected many of the pregnant women during that time period, but um, but I know for sure it has been a, a huge issue in the Western um, in West Indies, absolutely. Is there work being done, I mean, clearly with training younger midwives is being done, but is there other work being done to record their stories oh, in their good, native language that's a good to question. record their herbal wisdom? I have a, have a very dear friend of believes he was a medicine man. Okay. Knew about every plant in the jungle, mm -hmm. every single thing that grew beside the road to cure everything that happened to anyone. And when he died, all of that knowledge was just lost. Wow. And I wonder if they're, because they have this center, are they doing any work to preserve their stories sure. for, the, for the long term future? Um, I know that. Uh, I think that um, Asi Sena, is one that she's described too, she writes a lot of her things down in, in her journal. She keeps records of all her um, her herbal remedies. Um, but if that's just her personal um, her personal herbal remedy book that she keeps. And I remember she showed it to me when I was interviewing her, but I couldn't, you know, I couldn't make it out of a lot of the information Sarah had to translate for me. But she's the only one that I know of who writes it down. But that's a good point. I think that they should probably highlight that. Nicole can mention that to Antonina. So that they can start to preserve some of these this, this world of wisdom that they have because it's incredible and you're right that's that's a, that's important because as soon as someone dies off no one's going to know about this information so that's one of the reasons why as saying is training her daughter so that she can pass it on from generation to generation and keep that legacy going absolutely ronnie uh, uh, my question was um uh, i know they do a lot of natural birth but what about like birth in the well, they unfortunately they have they have this ambulance center that's maybe about I think it's about twenty five minutes from where they're located, and the ambulance takes them and has to literally transport them to the hospital. Um, and so it's it's a hard process. Usually, um, so oftentimes when they don't make it, they don't make it to the hospital. Oftentimes, if it's really a serious condition because it's so far that they have to travel. So, um, but that's one of the reasons why they're trying to train many of these um, the doctors and things of that nature to come out to. Um, the Concepcion Chiquiri Chapa so that they can establish another health clinic in that area to try and um, provide some of those services in their local community because it's too far from them to travel. Absolutely, that's a good question. But, uh, but Nicole's working on trying to make that happen. Um, but again, it, it's, I think it's the language barrier because they need somebody who's also who also can speak Mom and Kachikau and who can be trained in that. But a lot of the, the language isn't written down. So it, it's it's... It's hard. It's hard. Um, Unfortunately, we're going to be running out of time. So okay. um, if you want to connect with Essence, definitely get her contact information. She's a wealth of information um, in regards to this. So we thank you very much for your time, Absolutely. Essence. Thank you so much.